Matthew 10, verses 24 through 39. A disciple is not above the teacher, nor a slave above the master. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher and the slave like the master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing secret that will not become known. What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father, and even the hairs of your head are all counted. So do not be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. Everyone, therefore, who acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I will also deny before my Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And one's foes will be members of one's own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I know a lot of people are hesitant to share their personal testimony with others or witness to people. It can be scary. You might be rejected. They might not like you anymore. But this passage has a special significance to the church today, and that emphasis is fear not. And the particular fear that Christ discussed is explained in verses 32 and 33. The fear of confessing Christ openly before others. Warren Wearsby insists that God has no secret service, and Romans tells us that the public confession of faith in Christ is one evidence of true salvation. So we must not be afraid to openly confess Christ. Some things we are willing to shout. We shout at a football game, maybe. But other things we prefer to whisper. But here, we're supposed to be shouting. God whispers, we shout. God speaks in the dark, we tell in the light. The disciple must listen. William Barclay writes that he must be in the secret place with Christ, that in the dark hours Christ may speak to him, and that in the loneliness Christ may whisper in his ear. No man can speak for Christ unless Christ has spoken to him. No man can proclaim the truth unless he has listened to the truth, for no man can tell that which he does not know. But once we have listened, we do indeed need to speak. As Christian disciples, we listen with reverence and speak with courage because we know whether we are listening or speaking that we are in the presence of God. This passage is part of the so-called missionary discourse, which is the second of five major discourses in Matthew. It's a collection of sayings given by Jesus to the disciples as they set out on a mission of healing and preaching the good news. The disciples quickly learn what it means to face opposition and struggle as they are out preaching and healing. The cozy days of breaking bread with Jesus must seem far distant when in response to the good news of the Christian gospel, they are rewarded with persecution. And this will be a part of the Christian story for every generation to follow. What are we to do when we realize we are not strong enough to prevail? Christians will ask. The church will persevere, Matthew declares, in spite of all the trials of this life. Even in times of fear, the gospel will be true. But what of the individual disciple? 
Well, the individual and even the family must be of less concern than the overarching importance of proclaiming God's word. When the gospel's good news is heard and embraced, all of society, including the family and the individual, will thrive. But until that time, we don't have to be afraid of those who would destroy our bodies because they can't harm our souls. And no death, not the death of a person or even of a sparrow, occurs but for God's will. Jesus is asking the faithful to keep on because of our love for him. And because in the end, it will be real and everlasting life that we find. The word disciple means learner. We have accepted the call to become disciples and help others become disciples. But what does that mean? Discipleship is the process of learning what it means to follow the ways of Jesus. And as we go on this journey, we will suffer. Men persecuted Jesus Christ when he was ministering on earth, so why should we expect anything different? And 1 Timothy tells us that everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. But we should count it as a privilege to suffer for him and with him. And God sent his Holy Spirit to be with us through it. God will never abandon us. Jesus says that the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, will teach us all things and remind us of everything Jesus has said. Paul says the Spirit helps us in our weakness. And our suffering is not wasted. It becomes a testimony to our faith. We talked last week about how suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope. And after we have suffered for a little while, Christ himself will restore us and make us strong, firm, and steadfast, as First Peter tells us. And even in the midst of our hardships, we know that nothing can eradicate the gospel or destroy God's loving and watchful care over the faithful. Even when we are suffering, we must remember that the day will come when things will be seen as they really are, and we will receive our reward. When we proclaim God's message, we don't have to fear the present judgment of humans because we're living in the light of the future judgment of God. We need only fear God, and the fear of God is the fear that cancels fear. We need never to fear any humans. We know that God cares for all of creation. He cares for even the sparrows. But if God cares for sparrows, will he not also care for his children, we who are serving him? He certainly will. To God, we are of greater value than many sparrows. He is so concerned about the details of our lives that even the hairs of our head are numbered. God sees the sparrow fall to the ground, and God sees when a hair falls from the head of one of his children, and he protects us down to the individual hairs. Remember in Luke 21, 18, when Jesus says, not a hair of your head will perish. So we don't have to be afraid when we witness, but confessing him means so much more than just making a statement with our lips. It also means backing up that statement with our lives. Wearsby says it's one thing to say Jesus Christ is Lord and quite another thing to surrender to him and obey his will. The walk and the talk must go together. When we choose Christ, our priorities and values change from those of the society surrounding us. Sometimes this can even put us at odds with our own families. At times, families may even disintegrate, but a new family network is formed as we follow Christ. Jesus wasn't careful not to ruffle any feathers. He didn't come to keep the peace, but rather to make peace, a kind of peace that was actually quite dangerous for him and his earliest disciples. Many people were martyred for their faith early in Christianity, and many continue to be martyred in some parts of the world today. Even if we don't have to die when we spread the good news, we do have to sacrifice our lives to Jesus. We must die to self and live for him. The peace that Jesus brings will end up causing divisions, even among close family members and friends. 
One preacher says, it's a kind of peace that will bring about Facebook wars and Twitter trolls, uncomfortable holiday dinners, and changed relationships. This is because healing, restoration, and the conquest of death threaten the foundation of all human claims to power and defiance of God. All of this is because to Jesus, where there is no justice, there is no peace. So what does it mean to take up our own cross? It means we must follow Jesus's way of the cross, a way of love that proclaims peace and justice for all God's children, a way that sees the Imago Dei, the image of God, in our neighbors and even in ourselves. We must remember that all are made in the image of God, and we need to reflect the image of God in, our, in, in Christ. Taking up the cross means identifying with and standing with the marginalized, and this includes the policies we enact or support and the ideas behind them, because God's peace expects justice and asks for righteousness. One pastor says, if you want to know where Jesus stands, what he stands for, and with whom he stands, look for the places of brokenness and disease. Look for love, justice, compassion, peace. Look for people who are hurting, marginalized, oppressed, devalued. That's where we see Jesus drawing a line in the sand and taking a stand. Today, we need to bring the good news of Jesus out from the dark and into the light. We need to not just whisper Jesus' good news to those who are willing to hear it, but we need to proclaim it from the housetops for all to hear, no matter how people might receive it, and no matter how they might respond. And we need to live it out in our very lives. We need to take a stand for the marginalized and the oppressed, and advocate for justice, compassion, and peace. Aren't you glad that someone shared the gospel with you? Let's rejoice that we have heard the gospel, and let's shout it from the mountaintops.